Um, so today I'm going to talk about evaluating mobile messengers for implementation vulnerabilities. I'm Natalie Silvanovich, and I'm a member of Project Zero at Google. Project Zero is a team that looks at software from a user-focused perspective. We look at all software, not just Google software. And our mission is to make Zero Day hard. A lot of attackers use Zero Day vulnerabilities. These are vulnerabilities that are not yet known by the vendor for all sorts of purposes. And we want to make these types of bugs less prevalent and less available to attackers. Our biggest piece of work is that we spend a lot of time looking for these vulnerabilities so we can report them to the vendor so they get fixed and they're no longer available to attackers. But we also spend time working with vendors to make their software less bug prone. And we also spend a lot of time writing and talking about zero day vulnerabilities so that information about state of the art attacks is available to defenders. So one thing we've looked at recently is mobile messengers. And there's been a lot of indications that malicious people are using them. For example, um, this is a payout table from a company called Zerodium. Zerodium will buy zero day vulnerabilities and they post their price list online. So if you find a remote jailbreak in an iPhone that doesn't require any click to um, compromise someone's device, they say they'll pay $1.5 million for this. Meanwhile, if you find a vulnerability that lets you access someone's messages in various messengers, they'll pay up to $500,000 for messengers like WeChat, Facebook Messenger, Signal, WhatsApp. And this is an indication that they're buying these bugs so that they can use them. So this is one sign that attackers are looking for bugs in mobile messengers. There was also this news article about the UAE secret hacking team. And they used a tool called Karma that did not require the, the target to click and relied on an undisclosed vulnerability in Apple's iMessage. Meanwhile, there was not very much public information about how these attacks might work or where the bugs might be. So we started a project to find vulnerabilities in messaging clients uh, so that they could be fixed. And we also wanted to uh, gain a better understanding of how bugs and exploits work on these targets. And finally, we were hoping to understand possible structural improvements for messengers. So just to uh, look a little bit at a technical level, um, what was my goal here? So typically you have some sort of messaging client and you have a user who writes a message. And then the message gets encrypted and it's often just sent to the other user over the network and then they decrypt the message and they have it. Sometimes it's a little bit more complicated. Sometimes there's also an intermediary server that will add, an, uh, add a layer. So now you have your user encrypting their message and then the server adds a layer. And this is just data that the device wants to give to the server. And then this server that looks nothing like an actual server will process it, remove the layer, add in a new one that's information for this next device, and then give back the encrypted message, and then it gets de decrypted. But what's really important is what we wanted to do was put a malicious payload here. So before encryption, create some sort of malformed message that would allow code execution or some other undesired behavior here. So we're hoping to basically you know, ignore encryption, alter what's underneath it, and find a vulnerability that hopefully had some malicious effect. So we looked at uh, WhatsApp and iMessage. Uh, these are the examples I'll share today. We actually spent a fair amount of time looking at messengers, so this is by no means a comprehensive list. So for WhatsApp, um, the attack surface was kind of interesting. It was mostly written in Java. And Java is unlikely to have memory corruption bugs. It's a lot more likely to have logic bugs. Um, um, so we decided we were going to focus on the um, areas that have native code, which was only video conferencing. So this was a fairly small attack surface, all considered. Um, he here's how video conferencing works. And this is not specific to WhatsApp at all. You have, um, here on this diagram is browsers, but if it's WhatsApp, it's two mobile clients. And they'll first communicate to each other to figure out what they support, um, do a key exchange, that sort of thing. And then they'll have this encrypted stream of whatever they negotiated, often audio and video. And from a perspective level, a video conferencing um, typically looks like this. And 
This is um, consistent against most implementations. I looked at uh, FaceTime and WhatsApp and WebRTC, uh, which is in all browsers allowing video conferencing. And typically, they all used a protocol stack that looked like this. So uh, focusing on my right side, um, there is the network, and then there's transport, which is typically UDP, though um, there's no reason it can't be TCP. And then you use uh, ICE, Stun, and Turn just to resolve um, IP addresses and make it so that um, packets can be routed directly from one device to another. Then typically um, your call will be wrapped in TLS and then um, there's a protocol called SRTP. And this is the real time protocol which is what actually contains the video conferencing content and it often has its own layer of encryption as well. So what happens when the device actually gets some um, SRTP? Well, it will decrypt it, and there's problems with SRTP encryption historically, so often this will also be under TLS, so it's kind of double encrypted. And then there is the RTP. RTP will go through an error correction sequence if that's enabled to get the real RTP, and then it will be decoded into a buffer It'll be given to a codec which um, processes the incoming image or audio, and then you see it on your screen. So this is a fairly reasonable attack surface, um, even if in WhatsApp um, the only native code is um, video conferencing. So I looked at the Android app because the desktop app doesn't do voice. And um, I looked at the binary in IDA, and there weren't any symbols, but there were lots of log entries from a commercial library called libsrtp, or, or sorry, from, called pjsip. Um, libsrtp is an open source library that does um, the RTP processing. But anyhow, um, these two libraries both um, have, have the source available, even though for PJSIP you have to license it to actually use it. So I could see the log entries in there. So I looked through the binary for similar log entries, and I found one place where it mem copies a packet right before it gets encrypted. So I found that spot in the binary and thought that would be a good place to start altering the encrypted messages. I wrote a script in Frida. Frida is a tool that allows you on mobile devices to quite easily just hook all instances of a function and then send them to Python so you can do stuff with them. And um, I tried this, but this didn't quite work out. I did use it to confirm that this memcopy definitely did memcopy the packet and it was the right spot. But if I tried to actually make it a call with it hooked, it would be like such a slow call and it would eventually drop because this slowed down the packet so much. So basically, I used it to debug uh, binary changes, but I, I didn't use it for the final result. So I ended up changing this specific mem copy to point somewhere else in the binary, and then I wrote code in assembly so that it would load my library and then make a call in my library that would actually allow me to see and change these encrypted packets. Um, if you're interested, I ended up overwriting the GIF transcoder for this because you only use that when you're sending messages. So I thought, you know, so long as I don't use my special version to actually send GIFs, um, it would still work, and it did. So I tried this, and I had like regular debugging issues. It took a long time to, to like debug that assembly and make sure it was correct. Um, but after a while, I could log and, and alter the incoming packets. Um, when I made a call. So I'd make a call, the system generates the packets and then encrypts them, and that was where I was able to hook straight in. And um, logging was great, um, everything looked correct, but when I tried to uh, replay packets, um, that was by using these logs, it didn't work, which was not great because, you know, I get a crash once, I'm like, that's a bad bug, and then I can never get the crash again. So um, I looked at it a bit more, and it turned out the problem was in a format called R R RTP, and specifically in a field called um, the SSRC. If you think about video conferencing, theoretically you could be doing it a lot. You could be you know, on a Facebook call while you're also streaming a video, while you're also doing all these other things, and the endpoint needs a way to keep it all straight. So every time you create a channel like video or audio or anything like that, it'll have this random SSRC. And this is just random. Every time you do a video call, it is different. So it turns out that this was my problem. I needed to make sure that when I replayed it, it was the same identifier as the system thought it should be. 
So I fixed this up. Um, I discovered that WhatsApp has four RTP streams, um, even if you mute the call. My joke here was, you know, one for audio, one for video, one for synchronization, and one for good luck. I truly cannot figure out what someone would do with four RTP streams. Um, luckily, they all had different uh, payload types. So if you look here, there's the payload type. So that made things easy. I would look for a packet with the correct payload type, pull one out of the log with the same type, and then just fix the SSRC, and it worked. Um, so that was cool. I could, you know, make a call and then make exactly the same call and send the packets again. So I had one more problem, which was crash detection. I discovered that WhatsApp handles signal crashes internally. So if you have a crash in WhatsApp, what will happen is WhatsApp will catch it, it will crash it, it will log it, and then I guess set, probably send it to the server so they can figure out why you crashed. So um, this meant, unfortunately, it didn't get handled by the Android logging system, which meant that I couldn't see the crash. Um, for a while, I thought I was going crazy, and eventually I went and I stubbed out Signal and SigSet, and basically every call that I thought could be handling signals. And once I made all these calls do nothing, I started getting um, logs in Android. Um, so, so, so I thought this was an in interesting problem, something that I wasn't expecting. But it, a lot of the Android applications actually do this um, crash suppression thing. So I fuzzed a bit, so I sent it random data over and over until it crashed. And I found this one vulnerability, which was heap corruption in the RTP processing. So um, as I did this, um, it became clear that the signaling for the video conferencing was also done in native code. So um, when you were sending your key and saying what you supported, um, this was also a native thing. And um, what was even more interesting is it wasn't limited to the correct packet for the state. So normally, if you're doing a call, it'll be something like, I want to call, sure, I want to call, oh, I'll pre-accept you, okay, I'll pre-accept back, that sort of thing. And in WhatsApp, I think there's about um, four or five of these exchanges. And what was weird is, let's say you had not started a call and you said, well, I want to pre-accept. It would still process it. And even weirder, let's say, you know, you send, oh, I want to call, oh, that's a call accept. If you sent a call accept in the wrong direction, it would also process that, even though there was no reason that someone on that end of the call would ever need that packet. So this was... Um, a necessary attack surface, so I thought that made this um, even more interesting. So I reviewed each entry point, each packet processing, and I found some extremely boring crashes. Um, it would, you know, you would try and start a call, instead of starting a call, it would have a null pointer exception, and then the process would respawn, so it did absolutely nothing. Um, but then I found something even more interesting, which was, you know how sometimes these um, packets have the server layer? In this server layer, you would get the VoIP params from the server. And this was a huge JSON blob. And it set dozens of properties. Like, I'm not exaggerating if I said, like, I think it could set up to 200 different properties, initialization properties in WhatsApp. And I discovered that there was a way that you could send this and trick the server into sending your version to the peer. Most packet types would not do this, but one packet type um, would. And I thought this might be a good source of a bug. Um, so um, Tavis Orbindy helped me um, take this WhatsApp library that processed the JSON and set the parameters, um, run it on Linux so we could do distributed fuzzing and see if there were any bugs in that um, app on a large scale. And this turned out to be a lot of work, and we did not find any bugs doing this. Um, so I contacted WhatsApp, and it was sort of interesting. They said they were aware of other VoIP param issues, though not the one I had filed. And honestly, they fixed this report like extremely quickly. Um, so I'm not quite sure what the impact was, but I feel like it was probably something. Um, they said also that they were considering signing this, this um, blob so that they would never have a peer issue again. You can imagine if a de device, or if the server has to sign it, um, and do you use um, public key cryptography, then um, the, other, the other side would have to um, check the sign, and then you would never be able to send it from the peer unless you had the server's key. And I think that's a pretty good idea. And um, then they also had plans to reduce the attack surface, make it so that the packets have to be in order, um, that sort of thing. So I thought that that, that was pretty exciting. Um, 
But then this happened. And what was interesting about it is it was just so similar to what I looked at in terms of the actual bug. It was also a bug in RTP. But what was interesting is this NSO group who um, wrote the, this um, spyware that was used a fully remote vulnerability, they found a bug in signaling that made it so that when you started RTP, the person would not need to pick up the phone. So this made this um, vulnerability that I found where um, you would call the person, they'd pick up the phone, and then they'd have the problem to one where they could just call the person, they wouldn't need to pick up the phone, and then it would cause the problem. So this turned out to be a, a bug that did not require in, any interaction, and it was very serious. Um, and what was interesting about this is one of the most challenging things about this type of work is figuring how, out when to stop. And this was a situation where, you know, I'd spent a month and Tavis had spent a couple of weeks on looking at the signaling and it got to the point where I was like, oh, I think I should probably move on. There's nothing here. And then that turned out not to be the case. And that happens, but it is one of the most uh, challenging things in this type of work. So the, one of the things I did afterwards was iMessage. And um, unlike WhatsApp, the messaging features of iMessage are written in Objective-C. So there was a good potential for memory corruption vulnerabilities here. Um, I also looked at FaceTime, which turned out to be an extremely large project, so I won't um, talk about it today. Um, that would be the equivalent of um, WhatsApp video conferencing on the iPhone. Um, but I'll talk a bit about um, what we found in iMessage. And I want to mention that I worked with this uh, with Samuel Gross on my team. Um, so he's responsible for a lot of this work. So um, when we started off, Samuel um, wrote this iMessage sending and intercepting client. And like with WhatsApp, it used Frida. But because it was a single message, uh, we didn't have to improve it any more than that. Um, we could just um, hook this hook the right spot and send and receive outgoing messages. And we ended up hooking, um, I think it was dictionary encoding and decoding because um, the iMessages are a dictionary, so it was a good spot. So now that we could dump a messages, here's what a message actually looked like. And it's typically in what's called a binary plist format, which is a compressed XML format, though you can also expand it to regular XML. And an iMessage is a dictionary, and you can see it has a lot of properties. And here are some of what I thought were the important properties. Um, there's the plain text message content, which is like when you type hello, hello goes in the T field. But then there is this balloon identifier and balloon data. And this is for what's called plugins. So if you have an iPhone and you open up iMessage, uh, for example, there's this feature where you can talk like a giraffe. Right, you uh, point the camera at your face and you move your mouth and the giraffe's mouth moves like your mouth and then you can hit send and it's kind of fun. So um, that's called an iMessage extension and these two um, fields deal with it. The balloon identifier will tell the receiver what type of message it is. So it'll say like, I am a giraffe. And then um, the plugin data will be, you know, the actual giraffe video. And um, so this was an interesting attack surface. Um, then there's the ATI, which is the attribute, attribution info, which is used if you happen to send attachments. Um, it has information about them. And then there is the participants. And the most interesting fields were actually this BP and ATI, because it turned out that they usually contain serialized data. And it was serialized using the NS Keyed Archiver class. And this serialization format is also a plist, and it contains uh, dictionaries that have class properties and other properties. And um, what happens is these objects are created by calling a method in the class called init with coder, which then processes other properties. And specifically, uh, these init with coders have had several past bugs, um, some of which were found by Ian Beer on my team. So um, here's how the serialization actually works. So you can see on um, my right, there are some properties. There's a string, and then there's this class dictionary, which has the class hierarchy of this class called NSURL. And then on the right is the actual, or on my left is the actual object. So um, you can see there's this class that refers to this class hierarchy, and then there's the NS base and the relative, which are actually the contents of the URL. And you can see um, the relative is number six, which points to this string, which is natashenka.ca. 
So what'll happen is when this gets decoding, it'll say, oh, this is an NSURL, and then it will call NSURL and it with coder, and then that will pull these base and relative properties and use them to initialize the URL. So this serialization mes messaging does have some security features. Um, NS secure coding has two requirements. One is that if you write an init with coder implementation, you also have to inherit another method. And what this does is um, it will make it so that you can't accidentally create an init with coder. You have to have on purpose exposed it. Um, the other thing is that um, it requires you to provide a list of allowed classes. So at no point in deserialization can you say, I want to decode anything. You have to say, I want to decode a URL. I want to decode a URL or an array. You can have a long list, but you can't have nothing. So what's unfortunate is that this isn't mandatory. You can create safe deserialization, which requires secure coding, or you can create unsafe deserialization. And unfortunately, some of these methods are hard to tell apart. Like, you're totally gonna remember which one of these is safe and which one of these is unsafe at like all times. So our first idea is we thought, you know, someone has to have picked the wrong one. So um, we tried to figure out where deserialization happened. Um, I think the most interesting one was in Springboard, which is the UI of the iPhone, and it deserializes this uh, BP field for previews. Also, if it's an extension, um, based on that extension type, it can also call a custom method called preview text on it, which is even more attack surface. Um, it can all, this um, same field is deserialized in mobile SMS, but this requires one click. You actually have to open the SMS. And then also this ATI field is deserialized using the same decoding in ATI. And we decided to focus on the BP in Springboard just because that had the largest number of classes allowed as well as um, it had high privileges. So we started off trying to find this uh, insecure deserialization code call and Despite the confusing names, we looked at all of Springboard and all of IMS agent and did not find a single insecure call. So that was good. Um, so then we decided, let's look at these extensions, the ones that can do previews, and see if there's any misuse there. And there was this one bug. Um, it's not a very high quality bug. I think it's unlikely that an attacker could ever do anything useful with it, but it was just sort of interesting. Um, it would deserialize some byte arrays, and then it would deserialize a separate length, but that length was not actually guaranteed to be the length of the byte array, so it could read out of bounds. So we also had this idea, um, let's look at the link presentation layer. Um, link presentation is if you send a link in iMessage and you'll get a preview on the other side. And this is actually a fairly good design in that all the risk of sending the link is taken by the person who sends the link. You send the link, your version of iMessage loads it in WebKit, will pull out an image, pull out the title, and then send that to the receiver. So the receiver is not actually pulling that link unless they click that link, um, which is good. But we were hoping that you know, maybe if we sent some really malformed stuff, there was a way to trick it into opening the WebKit instance um, on the receiver side. And, um, we looked and looked and looked at this and we couldn't um, get it to work. And the reason this uh, would have been a good bug is because um, WebKit explo exploitation is well known. Um, there's lots of bugs in WebKit. Uh, people know how to exploit them. So this would have been like an easy way to do an exploit on iMessage. But unfortunately, yeah, we couldn't find any bugs like this. So then we decided, um, let's look at all the init with coders. They've had bugs in them before. You know, they might have bugs in them again. And that made us have to figure out what init with coders um, could we actually hit. And um, for um, Springboard, this was the full list. I won't read them out, but it's, you know, typical classes like string and data and number. But what's also interesting is that any subclasses of these um, classes that have init with coder implemented are also available for deserialization. And the way these end up being available is any library you import or DL open becomes part of what's available. And it's not the whole um, shared cache, but if you can think about something like Springboard, it imports like dozens and dozens of libraries. So that means that there were many, many subclasses of all these classes. So um, 
looking at this, um, one bug we found was in um, deserializing a URL. So pretty much um, this init with coder supports several decoding methodologies, and one was a byte array that was a book bookmark, and then it turned out that this bookmark was in its own serialization format that is different than the one I described, and that one had a heap overflow in it. Um, and what I thought was interesting about this bug um, is that bookmarks are never legitimately used by iMessage. If you're sending a link in iMessage, it is a string, it is not a bookmark. But because of how the serialization is a general library and it has to be able to deserialize any type of URL, um, this was available on a Mac and was able to reach this bug. So another um, bug I found was this um, NSData subclass and it could actually pull files off of your device remotely, which I thought was actually pretty wild for a single bug like this. Um, so basically, there's this class, uh, which is um, NSDataFileBackedFuture, which subclasses NSData. And what this is supposed to do is it will fill a buffer with a file late. So it will wait until you access it to load the file. So this class actually had two problems. One was when it, it would deserialize a length um, and not check the length of the file. So it's a um, similar problem to that digital touch bug where it could go out of bounds because it trusted the length. Um, but it, what was more interesting is you could bypass um, the check that the URL was local. So this was intended you would load a local file and they te tested that this is a local file, but you could put in like kind of a slightly malformed URL and say, actually, I want to pull that file from a server, and it would. And the reason this became a problem is now this lets you pull files, because um, you create this data with the local file. And then um, I'm going to gloss over this a bit, but there's a way you can convert an NS data to an NS URL with um, the whole um, file um, URL encoded, so you would just append this to the end of the URL as a parameter. And then you would use this bug again and visit that URL, and that means that all the contents of that file would uh, go to your server. So we wanted to keep looking, though. So uh, we had another idea, which is, wait a sec. So there's all these inheritances that, in, that in, implement it with coder, but what if they don't? And it turns out that regular inheritance rules apply. So let's say you have a nit with coder that you know, pulls out a bunch of objects and then calls a nit with capacity. If you have a subclass that, that defines a nit with capacity, that will get called. And that's even, um, I think, harder to visualize than the init with coder. I think if someone creates a class with a init with capacity in a library, they are not imagining that that's going to be part of the remote attack surface, but it is. So um, there are some direct inheritance checks. So there are a few classes in serialization that actually directly check that you don't do this, but most of them don't. So um, here's a bug we found. Um, this was in a class called pfarray, and it defined init with objects count, which is a classic way to um, def define an array. But unfortunately, this array, I don't know what it's supposed to be used for, but it doesn't create references to the objects in this array. I'm assuming it's used in some context only where they already have references. But because this was a subclass and the NS init with array init with coder called this method on this subclass, it would get called and create this uh, reference free array. And then when these objects um, were freed, or, or when the last reference was dropped, they would still be in the array, and this was a use after free. So that was, that was one fun bug, and we found another similar one that I won't go through. But then we started thinking even more about this deserialization. For example, what if an object has cycles in it? Like I showed you that example with the nsurl.base that was six, which referred to the string. What if it doesn't refer to the string? What if it refers to itself? Um, and the answer is it's complicated. So here's how deserialization actually works. Let's say you know, you've pulled out the plist and you know you're trying to decode ns some class. What it will do is it will alloc that class and then it will add it to a temporary dictionary which um, has no references, it just stores the pointer. And then it will call init with coder on the object. Then it will remove this from the temporary dictionary, then it will add it to a permanent dictionary and return it. Now what happens if you try and retrieve this object a second time? 
Well, um, it will pull it out of the temporary dictionary if possible, otherwise it will pull it out of the permanent dictionary, and then if that doesn't work, then you actually haven't instantiated this yet, and you go through the regular process. So there's two problems. One is that an object could be used before the init with coder is complete. You can imagine with this, if it's pulled out of the temporary dictionary from the init with coder itself, stuff could not be initialized because you're still in the middle of initializing it the first time. And then there's this other problem, which is if you read the documentation, um, any type of init function, including init with coder, is not guaranteed to return the object created by Alec. You provide it as a parameter, and then it can release it, or it can, and create its own object, or it can return it, and that's the function's choice. So you can imagine a decoder where it immediately frees this object and then starts some decoding stuff, and then that stuff wouldn't have any references to it. Um, I've never actually seen a bug like this, but it's something that you know, bothers me a bit because even if things are written as they're designed in the documentation, um, this could lead to use after freeze. So um, most of the problems we found, though, were due to that first problem. So this one, unfortunately, the fix that Apple issued did not fully resolve the issue, so I've removed info about the bug a bit. So basically, it is in a class that I won't name, and the problem with this class is that it, it decodes a linked list, and then based on that linked list, it will create a buffer, and then it will put the stuff from the linked list into the buffer. But then if you have a cycle in it, what will happen is you can create a situation where you know, it's creating the linked list and then it grabs the object itself, which forces it to create the buffer. But then when you use the object, more things have been added to the linked list and then um, this buffer is too short and stuff gets written or read out of bounds. And just in case you're ever wondering how I do this, um, I, sp I spent about eight hours drawing diagrams like this and writing XML to make this object that actually caused this crash and it was not that simple. And the most important part is that arrow that says bad. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, people ask me, oh, do you have a good way to do this? And the answer is no. Um, so here's another bug that was like this. Um, this was in a class called NS Known Keys Dictionary 1 which is one of those classes where you have to declare all the keys in the dictionary first and you get a lot of performance benefit in exchange for doing that. And in this one, you provide all the keys and then you provide the length of the keys, um, which doesn't have to be consistent. And this one, it actually does check that it is consistent, but it checks too late. It will deserialize the length, it will deserialize the buffer, and then it will deserialize other stuff that allows you to deserialize this again, and at which point you can now use the object, even though this check hasn't been performed yet. And um, th this was basically a consistency problem, and basically they, they fixed it pretty much by doing the check earlier. So you might wonder, why are there so many bugs in this? And um, here's the problem. Let's say you wanted to serialize a URL, just one object, one URL. What's the attack surface? What are all the things that could have bugs in it? Well, I think the first problem is it depends a lot on how you compiled this. Um, it depends on what frameworks you include in compilation. And for this example, let's say you just included one framework, uh, user notifications. Well, then your attack surface is obviously NSURL init with coder. And then if you have any subclasses in your application that's calling this, then that init with coder is in the attack surface. But also in that framework you included, if it ever subclasses URL, NSURL, that is also in your attack surface. But then there's more. So what does this NSURL init with coder actually do? Well, as I said, there are two options. It could decode a bookmark, in which case it will decode this data or it could decode some strings, in which case it will use the strings to initialize the URL. So to start off, this um, bookmark decoding is in the attack surface, um, but also all those types that were just decoded, all their subclasses are now in the attack surface. So now you have this NS dispatch data, all these string types, um, including an extra string type that was in this user notification framework, and um, then you have to continue down, right? All of 
these subclasses will also decode other classes. So there's NS array, NS dictionary, NS date, NS number, and then those will have subclasses. And this keeps going down and down and down until you have this huge attack surface. But also, there's this thing with the inheritance. So you use init with string and the string init with coder. So now all these init with strings are in the attack surface. And when you decode data, you init with bytes. So now all these init with bytes are in the attack surface. And um, you, you can imagine this for every class and every init with coder. And I think the worst thing here is that legitimate URLs certainly contain one string, right? Almost all of these features are never used except for the string. And imagine how much worse this gets for a large project. Imagine adding a few extra classes that are allowed, maybe not just a URL. Imagine importing a few more libraries. Imagine importing like 40 libraries, as many applications will do. And imagine being a developer trying to secure this. Imagine being a third party developer, not knowing what the subclasses in those libraries are, because this doesn't just include public classes, it includes private classes. Um, so my opinion is that securing this interface is an intractable problem. There are too many interdependencies between unrelated components. You can have, you know, one class from one library containing a property that's another class from another library that was never meant to go together. Um, it requires full knowledge of all other components to understand the attack surface, and it makes small changes to low-risk components have unexpected consequences. I don't think any of these bugs happened because someone knowing that this was part of iMessage decided to add these features and make them available. What happened was that someone made a change to the calculator, which is local, and then they needed to add two numbers, then they imported the calculator, and then suddenly that became a part of the remote attack surface. So now I'm gonna show a few demos. Um, these should be fun. Um, because I'm using someone else's computer. Um, sure, I will request access to this. Um, Yes, I am sure. Um, so. There we go. Hopefully that works. Um, so this is the demo of um, pulling the file. And this, unfortunately, is very low production value. Um, so you've got, um, you, I'm showing you the image right now. And um, what's happening here is um, I'm gonna show you uh, what the image is, and then I'm gonna send a message that pulls this image um, off of the remote device. So, um, So I'll start off by sending the message and then it will take a few seconds for this message to arrive. Yeah, I think, there, so the reason this takes so long is because um, unfortunately the way that I decoded the URL, it requires you to send a URL that is equal in size to the file you get back. Um, the limit of this is about 40 kilobytes, um, so it's kind of slow to arrive, um, but it does work and it's enough to retrieve things like images and you know, see a few messages and that sort of thing. So now this is my server and, um, And um, you can see that it's getting this um, 
URL. And then this is pre-prepared. Um, I didn't want to do the thing where I was videoing with one hand and then typing the link with my left hand. So you'll see I'll send a pre-prepared message that had this link in it. But if you were setting up a real framework to this, you would have it somehow transmit, transmit the link and then put the correct link in. So now I'm sending a second message that actually uh, dumps the image. It's funny, this is a video, and I'm still a little nervous about whether it's going to arrive every time I watch it. Um, <laughs> so there we go. I think we got the message, and it's going to start sending the image soon. Um, so you can see there's the um, image starting to arrive. And then what I have to do is I have to download this buffer and decode it. Unfortunately, the way I encoded the URL ended up being um, very, very interesting. So I ended up just writing a separate uh, Python script and decoding it. So I'll basically just download this buffer and then run the script. There we go, uh, running it, and then I was going to say, hopefully it'll just uh, load the image, but no, it is buffering again. Um, and there we go, there's the image. Yay! And then I have one more, more demo that's um, a little bit. Um, a little bit faster, thankfully. I'm going to request permission for it before I um, show it to you. So this, this one's actually quite exciting. Um, so I gave a similar talk at Black Hat, and we got this working like two hours before Black Hat. Um, which was uh, quite exciting, but this is actually a real exploit for these iMessage bugs. So one of the questions we get asked most often is, you know, sure, these are memory corruption, but can you actually exploit them? And pretty much um, we, we can. Um, this um, exploit demo uh, uses an unfixed bug, but we don't feel that it's bug specific. Uh, we feel that basically most of the memory corruption bugs, the one with the no references in the arrays, um, the one with the um, out of bounds linked list, um, they could also um, do this um, exploit. Um, the way this works is um, the biggest problem is breaking ASLR, which is basically that every time you load a library, it's in a different location. And this is a technique they use to prevent exploitation. So what we did is we sent a message that would cause a crash um, if the memory was laid out a certain way and would not cause a crash if it was, was um, laid out another way. And then Samuel wrote an algorithm that based on whether or not you received a delivery notification from the message, basically did it crash um, where is memory laid out. Um, and then after that, um, basically you put data on the heap and make a fake object and then you can um, call make fake calls on the object, and that allows code execution. So um, here is the uh, video, actually. Um, I don't think I'm going to 
show it because um, it's on YouTube, but basically um, just imagine that um, you're getting a bunch of messages that say breaking your ASLR and then a calculator pops up. Um, that's basically what happens. Um, but the idea is that we are able to um, use these bugs to actually have a concrete effect on the device. So um, I want to end off with some observations based on this research. Um, one is that um, managed code um, reduces, ri reduces risk, and it's not cost free. Um, of course, it's lower performance, it can be harder to use in certain situations, but I, I do think that we have n noticed a pattern where um, stuff that's written in managed code will typically only have logic bugs. Meanwhile, stuff that's written in native code will have both memory corruption and logic bugs. Um, another thing is that attack surface is important. Um, I talked about serialization, which um, that was an unnecessary attack surface, but there was also a similar situation in WhatsApp where they were able to call these messages out of order, even though normally um, it would require user interaction to get to certain stages, and that was unnecessary attack surface too. Um, so it's important to consider that and make sure that the, the smallest amount of code possible is available to attackers and you, you, know, you put as much as you can behind the click, behind the user having to do something. Um, and design is important, in this case it was serialization, but I think it's important to make sure that things are designed in a way that they don't lead to exploding attack surface and it's easy to enumerate. Um, also, I wanted to mention that I feel like um, encryption is by far the most studied area of either of these apps, and it's kind of unfortunate. Um, I mean, it's important that encryption is good, it's important that people can't read messages over the network, but I also feel that there's tons of research, you know, trying to find problems in these protocols, trying to make sure that they're absolutely perfect, that there are no small inferences you can make. Meanwhile, there is not a much, as much attention to, you know, can you just execute code on the other device and access all the messages after they're encrypted? And I think that's fairly unfortunate. Uh, that's an area that needs more attention. Because my observation is you don't see a lot of attacks where attackers were attacking the encryption, they found a way around it. It's a lot more common for them to do something like this to get access to the messages. So I also wanted to suggest some future projects um, for people who do research in these areas. Um, I think a very important area is preventing implementation errors. The reason these errors exist um, outside of design problems is because people make mistakes. And I feel like the technology and the understanding of how to prevent developers from making mistakes is not as good as it could be. And I think that's a good research area. I think it's also important that people look at high performance and safe languages. The reason that a lot of developers use native code is because um, managed code doesn't meet their needs. And I think the more things that could be in managed code, um, it would reduce at least these memory corruption vulnerabilities. I think it's also important to focus on the implementation aspects of design. For example, recently um, I was reviewing papers for um, another conference and um, there were a lot of papers where it was like, I designed this thing and the thing is perfect. And if you looked at the design, the thing was perfect. But there was no thought given to, you know, is it humanly possible for a developer to make this thing? You know, will it be bug prone? And I think that's a very important part of design that gets missed quite often. Not just like if you build it perfectly, you know, will it work? But considering the practical aspects of how likely things are to have errors in them is the best design. And I think that's something that is valuable, I think as its own topic, but also for people who design things to not just think about in theory, but in practice. And finally, I think attack surface enumeration is an important topic. Um, a lot of this was um, attack surfaces that weren't obvious. Um, I spent a lot of time you know, figuring out, oh, you can do video conferencing, oh, you can do signaling, oh, serialization is remote. And it would be nice if there were more tools um, to help developers and help people who are securing things uh, figure that out. Um, so that's it, thanks a lot. And hopefully we have a few minutes for questions.